Hello everyone. Row sampling is a simple, practical, and strong form of row hammer defense, but only if properly configured. We wanted to build such a defense, and when we looked at the literature, we did not find the recipe of how to configure it. We then decided to build such a recipe and share it with the rest of the community. All our code is open source on GitHub at this URL. My name is Stefan Seroyu, and I'm a researcher with Microsoft, and this is joint work with Alec Wallman. Before I begin, I would like to make two quick points. First, throughout my presentation, I will sometimes use RH to abbreviate Rowhammer. And second, I will assume you are familiar with DRAM and Rowhammer. Unfortunately, I will not present this in my talk due to time reasons. If you are unfamiliar with DRAM or you are unfamiliar with Rowhammer, you can find many presentations online on these topics. If you go to this URL, we have our own presentation that goes in much more depth on both these topics. Row sampling based row hammer defenses are one of the oldest and simplest classes of defense techniques suitable for a memory controller. Here on the slide, on the left, I have a simple diagram of a server equipped with multiple cores with a memory hierarchy. You can see L1 cache, L2 cache, and L3 caches, and with a few memory controllers. On each row activate, the corresponding memory controller flips a bias coin. And with a low probability P, where P is much lower than 1, the row address is sampled and the row is treated as an aggressor row. So here, in this animation, I have an activate going to row 1. We're going to flip a coin, but we're not going to actually sample this row. The next activate goes to row 7. We flip a coin. We're going to not sample this row. And the third activate goes back to row 1. Now, when we flip a coin, it turns out we sample this row. The memory controller performs a mitigating action such as refreshing the corresponding victim rows. A sufficiently high sampling rate P thwarts a row hammer attack because it ensures that an aggressor row cannot escape sampling with very high probability. Some of the earliest papers on row hammer introduce variants of sampling based defenses under the names of PARA and PRA or PRA. PARA stands for probabilistic adjacent row activation and PRA stands for probabilistic row activation. There are a variety of similar schemes in the literature that are variants of this idea. Sample a row, whenever it's sampled, declare it as an aggressor and perform a mitigation. Row sampling's main benefit lies in its simplicity. An implementation doesn't need to maintain any state. This is in stark contrast with other forms of row hammer defenses that need to store and look up and maintain large tables of rows that are either tracked or they are swapped or they are remapped in some way. Also, row sampling is very effective if properly configured. Given that row hammer defenses remain largely based on security by obscurity, we expect to see a resurgence of row sampling schemes deployed in modern CPUs. An important question this becomes, to what value should the sampling rate be set to provide an adequate level of defense? Answering this question must be done holistically for an entire system throughout its lifetime, rather than for a single bank or a single refresh window only, and it must make realistic assumptions. Unfortunately, previous work doesn't thoroughly answer this question, and the absence of a rigorously analyzed formula for setting P is dangerous. A misconfigured row sampling implementation could leave a system vulnerable. And also, catching this uh, misconfiguration is very difficult. Uh, testing actually doesn't work very well. With today's memory controllers, the only way we can think of catching an improper sampling rate is only by observing um, uh, bit flips in DRAM. So this is an outline, outline of our talk. Um, I'm going to next talk about the DRAM model and the assumptions we made in this DRAM model when we analyze it. Uh, followed by our thread model and why some of the assumptions made by prior work were not sufficient. And I'm going to present you quickly the formula and I'm going to go over the demo on our results and I'm going to wrap up with conclusions. Most row hammer defenses assume a simple and uniform DRAM model. We'll use the same uniform DRAM model in our work. Let me describe it. Here I'm showing a pictorial representation of DRAM in which we're activating one aggressor row. Once we activate the row a sufficient number of times, bit flips will occur on victim rows. This attack is known as a single-sided attack because there is just one aggressor row activated continuously. To recap, the attack is successful only when the number of row activations of the aggressor row reaches a threshold known as the row hammer threshold. This threshold needs to be reached within one refresh window. 
Second, all DRAM rows are identical. There is no one row that's weaker than another one. Any row um, has the same threshold, so any row can become an aggressor row, and if the number of row activations become higher than that single uniform global threshold, then the attack succeeds. Third, victim rows are rows within a blast radius of an aggressor row. In our example here, BR, that stands for blast radius, is two, meaning we have two victim rows above the aggressor row and two victim rows below the aggressor row. Earlier row sampling schemes assumed that the remedy used by the memory controller is to activate victim rows. Unfortunately, internal DRAM row topology remains a closely guarded secret by DRAM vendors. This leaves the memory controller unable to identify those victim rows affected by a specific aggressor row. As an alternative, researchers have proposed the addition of a new command called NRR, or Neighbor Row Refresh. When it detects an aggressor row, or when it samples an aggressor row, the memory controller issues NRR to report the aggressor row as addressed to the DRAM devices, and the DRAM devices refresh the corresponding victim rows. We expect NRR to be incorporated in all uh, in upcoming DDR5 DRAM specifications and to be supported by all DRAM vendors. Second, we will not incorporate in DRAM row hammer defenses in our, our analysis. These defenses are known as TRR, and TRR is proprietary and incomplete. And as long as TRR defenses remain secret, secret it is difficult to incorporate them in our model. So I just finished going over the DRAM model and assumptions we made. Next, I'm going to describe our thread model and why some of our prior work's assumptions were insufficient. To analyze row sampling schemes, we assume a worst case but realistic thread model. Our thread model corresponds to a software-based remote attack. The attacker can run arbitrary code on the host, but cannot change the hardware, the firmware, or the settings of, uh, in the BIOS or UEFI. The attacker knows about the row sampling scheme, it knows about its implementation, and it also knows the value of P. P here is the sampling rate. The attacker is free to activate any row in any order, but without violating the DRAM bus timings and correctness. The DRAM is configured to run at a normal refresh rate. The memory controller issues 8192 refresh commands to a rank every refresh window, and a refresh window is 64 milliseconds in DDR4 and 32 in DDR5. Single-sided attacks are the most effective attack strategy. We have a footnote here to say that this statement is true in the absence of TRR. Unfortunately, like I said earlier, as long as TRR remains secret, we can't really incorporate it into our model. An attack strategy that activates another row is suboptimal for two reasons. First, activating the other row doesn't bring the attack on the first row any closer to success. Second, a successful attack that hammers multiple rows remains successful and even increases its chances of success if the attacker were to redirect or re-aim all those hammers to one single row only. Prior work assumed a single necessary, but unfortunately insufficient condition for an attack to be successful. One row must be activated k times without being sampled within one refresh window and k has to be greater than the row hammer threshold. This condition is insufficient because it assumes the absence of background auto refresh. A series of back-to-back -back row activates lasting longer than this row hammer threshold is not su a successful attack if the victim row is auto refreshed in the meantime. So I have a simple animation here at the bottom to explain this, this, this issue that we're talking about. So again, we're assuming a single-sided attack, and here in yellow you see row activations, and they're all unsampled. And every once in a while you're going to see a blue or, or I don't know, turquoise uh, activation that is being sampled. Okay, so um, is, is the attack successful? Well, let's see. Well, here we're going to sample a row before the number of row activation is greater than our threshold, so the attack is prevented here, it failed. From here on, we're not sampling anymore, but we're, again, we're sampling this row. So again, the attack failed because, because we haven't had enough activations accumulated until we sample one and we issue the remedy and we fix um, uh, the, the row disturbance. The next one, still not good enough we, because we have sampled again this row. But the last one is, is good enough, actually. So previous work assumed that as long as we have a number of consecutive row activations that are above the row, uh, the row hammer threshold, the attack is successful. Well, this is 
necessary, but it's not sufficient because the victim rows could have been refreshed in the meantime. So imagine that here we would actually refresh a victim row. Well, the attack will then fail because that victim row is being refreshed, even though we had enough activations row without being sampled. So we have to take into account this factor also when we actually do our analysis. To the best of our knowledge, an attacker doesn't have a way to infer or learn when a specific victim row is auto-refreshed. As the attacker cannot avoid the case when the lucky series of back-to-back -back unsampled row activation still fails to flip bits because it overlaps with an auto-refresh of the victim row. Thus, our threat model is weaker than assumed by prior work, but it's more realistic. So I just finished uh, the threat model. Next, I'm going to go into how we derive our formula. Now, on this slide, we're showing the previous formula used by uh, a paper called Graphene that appeared two years ago at Micro. And if you look at this formula, it's a recurrence formula. It's actually um, very, wisely, very nicely explained how it's been derived. There are two shortcomings with it. First of all, it assumes this unrealistic remedy of issuing activates to one of the two victim rows because it actually uh, analyzes PARA and PARA assume that the remedy is to activate the victim row. And like I said earlier, that's not possible in practice because you don't, the memory controller doesn't know the identity of victim rows. So the correct formula has to use the NRR command and we're going to assume that the NRR command doesn't uh, uh, refresh just one of uh, the adjacent victim, row, victim rows, but all of them within the blast radius. And there's a second problem here that I'm not going to go in detail, which they have an off by one error in the recurrence, and this, this is fairly easy to fix. So we're going to apply the two fixes to the previous formula, and this is kind of the new fixed, uh, the new, still a recurrence formula. We have an extra condition that was missed in the previous formula, and we also, assuming an RR, we got rid of the factor. There was a couple of factors of... Uh, if you look here, you know, one over two p, so we got rid of those two. So this is actually the correct formula of escape link sampling. Further, we have to go and fix the previous assumptions made, like I described before. Um, this, um, you know, we, we are going to assume that the attacker doesn't know when a victim row is refreshed. We are going to also assume that the attacker can launch attacks in parallel. So uh, previous work actually assumed that the attack is going on to one single bank. And here, you know, we want to sort of be more holistic about uh, an entire system that has multiple banks in parallel, uh, you know. Um, and finally, the attack could last for a lifetime of hours, days, or months. So you have to take this lifetime parameter into account. And unfortunately, I'm not going to go into the details. This is our for final formula. There is some math in the paper. Um, the math is not super complicated because it's not, it's done by us who are truly not mathematicians, we just kind of are hobbyists. So um, this B here is the number of banks in parallel and act total here takes into account the lifetime of the system. Okay, now I'm going to just jump into our demo and show the results we have. So let me quickly demo. Um, our code here, once you check out our GitHub repository, it's going to check out a whole bunch of Python scripts. The main script, the one that actually calls everything else, is called Rowhammer Sampling. And if you pass in the dash dash help parameter, it's going to print out a whole bunch of configuration options. Um, so I'm going to now show you uh, what happens if you run the script that computes the failure rate given a, a configuration of an isolate server, uh, given an attack lifetime of an hour, a Rowhammer threshold of 4,096, and the sampling rate of 2%. 2% uh, means on average, we're going to sample one in 50 packets. And then you have to pass in also a precision parameter. Uh, 100 is pretty good. Uh, talk to us if you want to understand what precision of computation you should use. The higher the number, the better. So once you run this script, it's going to print out the configuration you're running. Uh, the script takes about two minutes for this configuration to compute the failure, the raw hammer failure rate. So we have a nice like, server with two sockets, eight channels, two DPCs, and so on and so forth. I'm speeding up this video. Uh, this, like I said, takes two uh, minutes. And the failure rate is nice. It's pretty low. It's three times 10 to the minus 27. That's, that's a very good failure rate for this configuration. So you can use this script to actually uh, uh, test your favorite configuration and your favorite parameters. And it's going to tell you what is the raw hammer failure rate. So to wrap up, um, 
In our work, we put forward a formula for configuring row sampling, row hammer defenses. Uh, we have put together uh, a piece of uh, a script that's easy to use for deriving or even sanity checking the configuration of a sampling scheme. So our goal here was uh, to really encourage everyone developing hardware and thinking about row sampling to be judicious and careful about how they configure their sampling rates. And we've done the best we could to actually make easy to use code uh, to, to sort of uh, do your own homework and make sure that the system you are uh, putting together this defense for is actually going to be well configured. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take questions. All right. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice talk, Stefan. Um, so there is one question um, in the chat. Uh, by Victor van der Feyn. Um, the question is, do you plan to uh, bring this to JDEC? That's a great question. I don't have plans. I could be convinced otherwise. Uh, I'm not, yeah, I don't, there has to be the right um, goal for bringing this to JDEC. So maybe 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 Victor can can tell me what the right message and goal is. It's just basically right now it's it's a way to at least sanity sanity check your configuration. Um, and and if there is a if you if Victor thinks that there is a way to make that formula JDEC, sure we can do that. We're not against bringing it to JDEC. We just don't have any plans. Good. Uh, so Tanj uh, has a question. Uh, right. Go ahead. The, the um, example you gave on the isolate server um, appeared to say that you could basically run for the lifetime of the universe and not worry. Um, without naming names, I assume that you've run what you believe to be realistic parameters on various machines. Did you find that with realistic parameters, the level of concern is significantly higher? And what's the worst you've seen with what you believe to be out there? Okay, so uh, so let's see. So first of all, the in that demo I showed, the, we assume that the attack will not last for more than an hour. And you can decide for yourself whether that's realistic or not, right? So it's... Um, at, at one and, minus 27, I'm prepared to wait a long number of hours. Right. So if definitely. So depending on the type of the way I would answer Tanji's question is the following. Depending on the type of system you want to defend, you should think hard about the lifetime. So and and tell me if I'm wrong. This is my sense here. And I haven't thought. So I've been thinking a lot about defending data centers. And clearly defending data centers attacks will last much longer than an hour. Uh, now, if you are building this to defend your iPhone, maybe an hour is okay. I, I don't know. I, I, that'll be, maybe I'm wrong. So tell me, like, I, I don't have a lot of experience. But for that, you know, an attacker will try for an hour. And if it doesn't succeed on your iPhone, maybe they'll move on. I don't know. Or maybe you want to want to. That lifetime is important because it actually uh, uh, increases your sampling rate, right? So to produce the same set of uh, Rohammer uh, rates, of, rates of failure, the longer the attack, the more aggressive you need to sample. Um, and now- for Right, I, hours, I mean, rather than focusing on hours, look at that 1e e minus 27. To give you an idea of what that is, um, recently Intel presented some work on uh, multi-chip modules, and they were very proud of their adjacent chip interface which has a bit error rate of about 1e e minus 27. And that's per nanosecond per thousand bits. And still, if you do the math, you know, you're talking about centuries before those things fail one bit. So what I'm that's why I'm asking, you know, did you try other configurations? And I, I think the hour, leave it an hour, you know, unless you're seeing more than one part per million in an hour, um, you're not in a range where an attacker is interested in, in trying it because the number of hours they'd have to rack up in computer time uh, for very, very slim pickings. 
you know, um, they'll go and look for some other, some other effect. Of course, you've got, say, non, you've just got acts of nature, things happening in the system, which could cause those problems, and they'll, they'll be going on forever, but they're not going to be at the most elevated rates. So that's why I was asking, have you tried running that formula with a variety of realistic systems, and what was the worst number you saw? I see. Now I understand your question. No, we have not tried running on. We we have a particular configuration in mind that we are targeting for Microsoft. Um, however, that being said, the script guys, it's super easy to use. It's just, uh, I mean, just write and run your own favorite configuration, and literally it takes two minutes to give you a number. So if you have a thousand different configurations right that's in in you know in a couple of days you're done you have you have complete visibility as to the entire configuration space so there is a lot of the space the the, the size of the exploration space is quite large and pick, choose your favorite system script is really really easy to use you can also run it in parallel to use this one core so that was done on a simple one core machine uh single single threaded uh it took two minutes so if you have multiple cores it's even faster so yeah thank you. yeah sorry Tanj, i don't have a good answer to your question thank uh, you yeah so um so just uh sort of like uh, 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 uh sort of repeating what victor said in the channel uh, he thinks that it would be good for uh hardware manufacturers to be aware of uh, your work but uh, i also have a question goes a little bit into the direction of what Tanj was asking right and I wanted to know sort of uh, at which point uh, when uh, would this not work anymore, right? So you showed an example with a Rohammer threshold of 4K, right? And we all know that this Rohammer threshold is going oh, down, right? Yeah. So at which point does it not make sense anymore to do this like probabilistic uh, row sampling? Yeah, so so I mean, yeah, so this is this is a little bit outside the scope of this paper. In uh, It's a great question. It's outside the scope of this paper. In other words, if you set that uh, row hammer threshold very low, it's going to come back and tell you, yeah, if you want the rate of failures of 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 27, you need to sample one in two activates or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the tool tells you the rate, okay. and then you can look at that rate and you go, oh my God, uh, how would that work in practice? Okay. Uh, so you don't have a number for us uh, at which no, point we should uh, not use this anymore? I do not. No, I actually have not. To be fair, to answer both your question and Tanish's question, I have not. we have not done a good job of really exploring the space and answering these kind of questions. That being said, it's really easy to answer the questions given the tool. Yes. Uh, so yeah, so this is also for all the audience. You know, we have these workshops. Of course, you can send your early work and this would be the place where you get feedback to make your uh, work more complete and potentially send it uh, to, a, to a conference. Uh, okay, with that, uh, I would like to thank Stefan uh, for the nice talk and also uh, the nice discussion.